Welcome to the Central Baptist Bible Institute. We are thankful that you have decided to join us today. We hope that you are just as excited about this new year in Bible Institute as we are. I'm Tyler Candy and I'm the media director here at Central Baptist Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. And I'd just like to go over a couple things with you before we get started today. First of all, if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, go ahead and do that now by pressing the subscribe button. Also hit the notification bell icon so that you can be notified of future videos that we post onto our channel. Secondly, if you aren't following us on Facebook or Instagram yet, follow us there so you can also view the wonderful media posts that we have each week. You'll find the link to that in the description below. And finally, to help us get a more accurate number of attendees, we have created a short check-in form for you to fill out. There's only four questions and only two of them are required. You can mark whether you are attending during our live stream event or whether you are watching it from our archives. The link to that check-in form is also in the description below. That's all. Thank you for your time and now get ready with your Bible, with your notebook, and with your pen as we go live to the Central Baptist Church Auditorium with your teacher and our pastor, Dr. Brad Winter. We'd like to welcome everyone today to our Bible Institute session 1902. I'm Pastor Brad Winnegar, and we are broadcasting this day, October the 12th, 2024, from the auditorium of Central Baptist Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. Welcome one and all. We have students all around the world of all ages and all backgrounds, and God bless each and every one of you as you seek to fulfill God's call upon your life. And as he equips us through the word of God, let us be faithful in applying all the truths that we are learning from the word of God. Uh, we recall what we said last time in our, <laughs> our nearly marathon session of approximately three hours, 1901. Dr. J. Frank Norris said, what is needed is a school that teaches the whole English Bible. And then he goes on to say, that God takes ordinary people uh, to serve an extraordinary God, and he does the equipping. And thank God that we can be a small part of this. Uh, we are in the book of Exodus, which means the way out. And it describes Israel's bondage in Egypt and their wonderful deliverance or departure, uh, as the scripture uh, recalls for us uh, in uh, the departure of the people from bondage in Hebrews Hebrews and chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 22 says, By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. Now the word departing there is the same underlying word, the meaning of the book of Exodus. Think of exits and leaving and departure. And that's what we've got in the book of Exodus as we continue. This is our second year in the book of Exodus. We have come through parts uh, A and B and are moving on now. We're going to look at that in just a moment and praise God for the individuals whom he raises up to serve him. The book of uh, Genesis is the book of beginnings. We know that we spent several years looking at the very uh, first 11 chapters and then Abraham, and then Isaac, and Jacob, and finally Joseph, and now last year into Exodus, and uh, seeing how Moses comes on the scene, and Moses is such an important individual. The book of Exodus has as a theme the same theme as we have for the entire Bible. Someone asks you, what is the meaning or the theme of the Bible? You say, it is redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Redemption through the blood of of Jesus Christ. And book, the book of Exodus, as we know it, is a book about redemption. It records the deliverance of Israel uh, from Egypt and presents the historical facts about the origins of the Hebrew nation, what began as an individual, a family, a uh, family line of the patriarchs, and then eventually down in Egypt, forming a, a nation, although it was a slave nation, and God raises up Moses to lead them out of their bondage and across the Red Sea and into the wilderness where we find ourselves today as we approach the giving of the law as a codified system 
and as a basis for their living. It will be a dispensational identification as we look at it over in the book of Acts. I could I could take it from Exodus. I could take it from the book of Hebrews, as we've already referred, but we're going to go to Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, and remember now, uh, just as the scripture has told us that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, that we are to take the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, and we are to view it with a very high view as being the very uh, inspired and preserved word of God. God breathed, as we read in 2 Timothy and chapter 3, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, uh, for instruction, for, for correction. And all of these elements, of course, so very important as we pass the truth along to the next generation. So we find it now in the book of Acts, chapter number seven, from the lips of a preacher. From the lips of a preacher, we find this uh, beginning at verse number 20 in chapter 7, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and they would have set him, set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me? as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday. Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai uh, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush? That's the angel of the Lord himself. He brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. We've gotten that far. And in the Red Sea and in the wilderness, 40 years. Now look at verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like, un like unto me him shall ye hear. So please mark down that scripture, Acts chapter 7 and verse 37, where we have the terminology, God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. I could take you to scriptures again and review those which state emphatically that Moses is the author of this book and of all five of the Pentateuch books that we have known as the law of Moses in John chapter 7. In John chapter 7 and verse 19, Jesus speaking said, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? So Jesus Christ himself is uh, declaring that Moses is the author, the writer, the human scribe who wrote down the first five books of the Bible, which we know as the Pentateuch. Here Stephen declares very clearly uh, that Moses is that a prophet who is a type of Christ. Now please note this on the screen. Moses is a type 
of Christ in his office and in his character, plus other comparisons. And I want to speak to you for just a moment about the subject of types. Uh, We need to develop a disciplined and enlightened typology that enriches our study of Scripture and enables us to rightly divide the word of truth, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. The English word type, T-Y-P-E, is from the Greek word tupos, and uh, it means print, pattern, form, example, and uh, we have it given throughout the New Testament, uh, representing uh, shadows and figures and symbols and copies or patterns. These are uh, antitypes of the types that they represent. Type is an Old Testament uh, institution, event, person, object, or ceremony, which has reality and purpose in biblical history, so it's historically correct, but which also by divine design foreshadows something yet future. How many of you love prophecy? I'm a lover of prophecy. A great percentage of Scripture is actually prophetic in nature, and sometimes the word prophecy is used uh, synonymously with preaching or proclaiming the truth. Uh, The type that I speak of is similar to, but not exactly the same as prophecy. Both point to the future. Both verify the truth. But prophecy is more specific and teaches a doctrine. Mark that down. Prophecy teaches a doctrine, whereas a type only illustrates a doctrine. So prophecy teaches a doctrine. uh, A type illustrates the doctrine And you've got to be careful in that we don't take a type uh, too far or any of the other metaphors or figures of speech in Scripture. It is illustrative. It it points us in the right direction, but that's it. So praise the Lord. We have uh, certainly uh, something to work with here. However, we don't want to take it too far. When you have a type, you, you recognize it as such because of how it is introduced and how it is presented. There was in the second and third centuries a writer uh, in Bible, in uh, post-Bible times known as Origen. Be careful. Origen was an allegorical preacher. That is, he made everything represent something else. And rather than being literal, he was figurative in his total approach. Uh, This is typology taken to its extreme. We want to be careful not to do that. And as time went on, preachers began to do more and more of the allegorical, introducing their own ideas, thoughts, and systems into their preaching and their teaching until uh, the teaching of Christendom became overloaded with that which was extra-biblical. Subsequently, uh, as a pullback from that position, Bishop Herbert Marsh of England put down his dates 1757 to 1839, last name Marsh, M-A-R-S-H, Herbert Marsh of England enunciated what came to be known as Marsh's Principle. For you that want to go deeper and study, Marsh's Principle is this, that nothing in the Old Testament is to be considered typical unless the New Testament also declares it to be so. So we have certain guiding principles in uh, locating, identifying, and interpreting types. The historical purpose of the event, person, or institution should be discussed before typical elements are presented. If the historical element is ignored, the interpreter, in effect, is allegorizing the biblical text. So you have to start out by giving reference to the history of the item, whatever it is. And then a unity must exist between a type and it's anti-type. There has to be a connection between the Lamb and Jesus Christ, and and so on. And this uh, is important for us. And nothing of a forbidden or sinful nature can ever be uh, declared or even uh, implicated as being right if, in fact, it is declared to be sin or wrong. So we cannot put a, a stamp of approval 
on any false typology that's taught with that approach. And so we need to be careful about that. And a type uh, should not be pressed in all of its details, just as we take parables and as we take um, uh, uh, small figures of speech. You don't want to hang a lot of doctrine. Maybe one specific truth uh, is being taught and uh, being illuminated by it. So the types of Christ in the Bible are clearly stated and connected between Old and New Testament and uh, in nature and character. Uh, we believe that Moses, in fact, is a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ uh, in his office. He is a type of Christ as well uh, in his character, plus other comparisons. And so today I'm going to begin by looking at the types of, of Moses representing Jesus Christ, and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, this all uh, tucked among the other types. Egypt is a type of the world system. It's a type of uh, the old life uh, before Christ. It is a type of bondage. So true, we see the connection, Old and New Testament. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. He is a, a type of the God of this world who demands worship and defies God and thinks to enslave God's people. Israel represents uh, God's people, even though we understand uh, theologically and dispensationally the difference between Israel and the church, but God's people, generally speaking, uh, who are going to be led on a pilgrim journey from earth to glory and protected by God. And then we come to Moses, who is a type of Christ the Redeemer. He is a type of Christ the Redeemer. Uh, today, we want to get into this a little further. And uh, so let's look at how Moses is a, a type of Jesus Christ in his office. When I say office, I'm not speaking of a part of a physical building, but office in terms of a role or task appointed by God. There are offices in the church, pastor and, of course, deacon. We understand that. It is a role. It is not a part of the physical building itself. But turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Acts once again, the book of Acts. We're going to go to chapter number three, Acts chapter number three, as we look at the uh, office of Moses and how that is a type of Jesus Christ the Redeemer. All right, here you go. In, uh, in Acts chapter number three, Acts chapter number three and verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Put it down. Uh, this is going to be on assignment number one one of six ways in which Moses is a type of Christ in his office with the scripture given. So here it is, Moses, uh, like Christ, a prophet, and he is a type of Christ the prophet, according to Acts chapter 3 and verse 22. If you would turn back to Psalm 99, Psalm 99, and we'll see the second uh, way in which uh, Moses is a type of Christ in his office, all right? Psalm 99, and uh, here we are in verse number six. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. Now, in this psalm, Psalm 99, which tells us all about the holy office of priest. We have, we have, of course, Moses and Aaron as priests operating in that office, and Jesus Christ, of course, is a priest. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews. As we look back and forth between Old and New Testament, and especially as we look in the book of Hebrews, keep in mind that when we come to the conclusion of this study, uh, Toward the end of it, we are going to show the ways in which the Old Testament law is fulfilled and completed in Christ, 
and cannot stand alone in and of itself. It is deficient and needs Jesus Christ as the completer or the fulfiller of it. All right, Hebrews chapter number seven, Hebrews chapter seven and verse 24. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So the old things of the law have been set aside in the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. So in office, uh, Moses is a type of Christ, first as the uh, prophet, secondly as the priest, and thirdly, let's go back to Psalm 105, Psalm 105, and we're going to look in verse 26, Psalm 105, a great uh, psalm uh, that rehearses the history of God's people. You want to read that uh, in completion. All right, verse 26, he sent Moses his servant and Aram, Aaron whom he had chosen. Now the choosing is not arbitrary, but here we have an example of Christ in Moses of the servanthood of Jesus Christ. How important is that? Turn over to Matthew chapter 12. And this, of course, impacts our service for God because we're empowered, uh, given all authority in heaven and earth by Jesus Christ himself, who declares that in uh, the Great Commission. Matthew chapter number 12, Matthew 12 and verse 18. For this cause, the people also met him for that they heard that he had done this miracle, all right? That's John chapter 12, excuse me, and verse number 18. And uh, we have this servant, this Jesus that went about doing good and praise the Lord. Also turn back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, and we need this verse to go along with this point, Matthew chapter 12. And verse number 18, it says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. This speaks of Jesus Christ. So we see the role, the office of Moses, and his being a type of Christ in his being a prophet, a priest, a servant. Moving on to Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7. And verse 35, Acts 7 and verse 35. We've read it already. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. So by the call of the angel of the Lord from the burning bush, we have him now represented as a shepherd and as a deliverer. Praise the Lord. And then over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Many of these overlap. All right. John chapter 10 again and verse 11. And it says there, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. So there we have wonderful verses about uh, Moses and Jesus Christ being the shepherd. And then moving on, he's a mediator uh, back in the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus, let's go there. And to chapter 33, Exodus chapter 33. And verses 8 and 9, And it came to pass, when Moses went out into the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at the, his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Think about that. Over to the New Testament, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy and chapter 2. 1 Timothy and chapter number 2, verse number 5. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. And there it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man 
Christ Jesus. All right. So Moses, like Jesus, prophet, a priest, a servant, a shepherd, a mediator, and a deliverer, as we have seen already in Acts 7.35. Turn also to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And aren't you glad that he did that? He delivered us from the wrath to come. So Moses is a type of Christ in his office. Now, how this applies to us in these six different ways, you can uh, obviously see in our service as we carry out what the Lord has commissioned us to do, what he began in the Gospels and continue to do in the book of Acts and through the New Testament and now through uh, the, the local called out assembly, the local church and the believers who comprise it is exactly what he began to show in type in Moses. These offices uh, are important in that in and through Jesus Christ, we have fulfillment of these. And because of that, we have enablement so that we can effectively serve the Lord. I am so glad that there's no question about it. I've been called by God. I'm glad that there is uh, the uh, enablement given to me, the equip equipping given to me to fill the role. And some of you may be called of God to fill an office in the local church or an area of service. And let me say, be faithful. The number one thing God calls us to be, uh, he doesn't say be successful we know that he's promised to give us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, but instead we need to be faithful. We're going to stop now and discuss the aspect of the roles of Moses, the type that he is of Jesus Christ, and then also how this extends to us in our service. May we be faithful. And we're back. It's good to, to have everyone with us. In fact, we have uh, people tuning in from around the area around the country in, and even around the world. This is Bible Institute session 1902, 1902, and we are broadcasting October 12th, 2024. If you're, if you're wondering about the weather, you know, in our part of the world, it can be warm, it can be cold, it can happen quite suddenly. Other people have very uh, defined weather patterns and so um, we have, of course, entered into the, the months of autumn, of fall, and the, the leaves changing, and, and uh, we might get a brisk evening or even a cool day. So uh, kind of bundle up. Uh, by the next time we gather, we will have gone through a time change again, and, and uh, daylight savings uh, will be in our rearview mirror. Uh, we'll be in the the late fall and then uh, the holidays and into the winter months. So time is passing. And uh, that brings me to say this, what Dr. J. Frank Norris uh, encouraged us to do, we need to do. We need to, to make sure that we are applying all of the truth that we possibly can from this teaching. Praise God for the fact that it is timeless. I go back over 50 years, 50 years ago plus, my dad and I, uh, working in tandem, uh, I was his associate in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. We started a Bible Institute. Some of the same people and their kids and even grandkids <laughs> are now in included in uh, our uh, student body, if we'll call it that, uh, spread all over the world and, and uh, a distance between us, but brought together by uh, the miracle of technology. But the truth itself never gets old. I think back to those days when we were thinking about launching the Bible Institute in the early 1970s, and we contacted our longtime friend, Dr. Wilmington, who would not sell us his notes, <laughs> and then later on produced a book known as Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. But uh, he's gone on to glory, praise the Lord for him and his memory, and uh, thank, thankful for his friendship and his inspiration uh, by example through the years. We developed our own curriculum and a graduated number of folks that are serving God, have served God. Some of them are now singing in the heavenly choir. So praise God for them. Over, over uh, 30 years ago, actually 40 uh, years ago, nearly, 
Uh, we began our Bible Institute program in uh, California, and uh, there are uh, many who have been serving the Lord for a quarter of a century or more as a result of the training received there. Thank God for their faithfulness. Keep on. God uh, counts us uh, as uh, faithful and praise the Lord for that, uh, that we can say that. And uh, praise God for the second and third generation of folks coming through that institute and those institutes that were started out of that institute, that ministry in California. Now, we're in our 19th year here uh, in Northern Virginia. Praise the Lord. I want to go on teaching people how to go out with the Bible under their arm with faith in their heart and the power of the Holy Spirit and begin some place to preach and teach to the glory of of God until Jesus calls us home. Uh, we do recognize your work with a diploma for the first four years. If you will, if you will study with us for four years, uh, uh, these are sessions 001 through 100. They're on audio format and uh, with a dissertation that will be assigned and checked and presented. Uh, you can complete the equivalent of a bachelor's program. We call it a bachelor's diploma. We do not grant degrees. Uh, we do give out certificates each year, and then we give out diplomas for uh, the body of work that represents the equivalent of a uh, bachelor's program. We also have the advanced program, the equivalent of two years of work would be the master's program in Bible, and uh, it likewise is a diploma. We never charge a nickel uh, for any of your uh, work that you do. Uh, we don't have tests. We don't have grades. Your grade is how you can use it for the Lord. I say hello today to people spread all over our country, all around the world. You are a great inspiration to me, and I thank God for you. Thank you for the opportunity to be your teacher in this matter. And as we assigned last time, the verses 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 3.15-17, Remember that, uh, that this is very much like our last session, a marathon. You're in it for the long haul. It's a journey. Uh, let's be making disciples along the way. Let's be training and bringing folks uh, into an area where God can call them into service. And that's where we closed out uh, in our teaching just a few moments ago, a listing for assignment number one, the six way ways in which Moses is a type of Christ in his office. We talked about types and the limits on types. Don't be an allegorical or figurative preacher, but rather just use the biblical types that are verified by the New and Old Testament together. That's why crossing the Red Sea is a picture of resurrection, which delivers the believer from this present evil world. Uh, manna is a type of Christ, who is the bread of life, John chapter 6. Uh, the Smitten rock is a type of the smitten Christ whose death, uh, by whose death the Holy Spirit uh, is, uh, is given to us. And then Amalek, who came up and uh, warred against God's people, is a picture of the flesh. He is a descendant of uh, Esau and the flesh, opposing the believer in this pilgrim journey. Uh, the Passover, which was the last of the plagues in Egypt and by which they were delivered, pictures the death of Christ, the application of the blood uh, to be an outward witness, the appropriation of his life, uh, feeding on the lamb for our daily strength. All of, all of this is to be considered and uh, is part of our review. Now, when we looked at assignment one, here it is again, mark it down. Moses, like Christ, was a prophet, Acts 3.22, was a priest, Psalm 99, 6, and Hebrews 7, 24, was a servant, Psalm 105, 26, and Matthew 12, 18, a shepherd, Exodus 3, 1, and John 10, 11 through 14, a mediator, Exodus 33, 8 through 9, and 1 Timothy 2, 5, and our deliverer, Acts 7, 35, and 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. These are important to know. And uh, so you need to memorize those and write them down for assignment number one. As we continue on, these types are so very important. Now, we also have some other types of Moses. No doubt about it, 
Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Jesus said he wrote the Pentateuch. He is the one referred to as the law of Moses. And uh, what a character, what what um, attributes he bore, how important it is for us to know how he was. And there are there are four characteristics of Moses which mark him as a type of Christ. This is going to be uh, your second assignment, but I want you to, to go with me as we teach it. Let's go back into the Pentateuch to the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, and uh, let's turn to chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12. It won't just be in this passage of Scripture, but we find it elsewhere as well. All right, Numbers uh, chapter number 12, Numbers ch- chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Now, some of the uh, offices and characteristics of Moses that are true of Jesus Christ are also to be uh, demonstrated in our life as we yield to the direction of the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit uh, being shown out of our life. When we step out of the way and we allow the Spirit of God to have complete control of our life, then we model the life and mannerisms of Jesus Christ. Some of the uh, aspects that we have covered in assignment number one, we admit uh, only covered by Jesus Christ, who is typified by uh, Moses' example. Uh, I realize that I can't be the mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, but I can declare who Jesus is. I can declare him by my words and by my life, and thereby every aspect of the assignment one offices of Moses and of Christ can be lived out of our life. Uh, The second assignment, the four characteristics, we see in these mannerisms and uh, uh, attitudes and behaviors that should be present in a servant of the Lord. And today, may I encourage you not to fall into the trap. I saw in the last half of the 20th century, uh, some of the work of God greatly hindered because some fundamentalists who were right in their position were wrong in their attitude. And it seemed like an inordinate amount of time was wasted by individuals and their factions trying to determine who is going to be the pope over fundamentalism. Keep in mind there's only one Lord Jesus Christ overall. And keep in mind that we are uh, to uh, humble ourselves in order to have uh, the revival that God wants to send through us. My people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. We need to be people of humility and prayer. Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I know that Second Chronicles 7.14 and it's Old Testament and dispensational interpretation and placement, but it also in principle refers to believers in all ages that we need to constantly be coming back to the Lord and asking him uh, to mold us and make us and form us so that we might be as he is in this world. Well, that is Moses. Moses uh, had a, uh, a sterling uh, uh, character and was um, above board. And, and uh, even though he took the law into his own hands and, and killed the wicked Egyptian taskmaster and had to flee for his life, God was working on him for the next 40 years on the backside of the desert. God is working on you and me. We need to be meek. Now, meekness, as you see in the fruit of the Spirit, over in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, we understand meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. And so according to Philippians chapter 2, uh, Jesus Christ divested himself of the independent use of his attributes as God, humbled himself, and became obedient. He was completely directed by the Spirit of God when he was in the days of his flesh here on earth. We have not long to live, and so our service for God needs to be that of a, of a servant with a servant's heart, and we need to be humble and meek. And when God is working on us, we need not to complain and drag our feet, but instead allow the Lord to have his way and and knock off the rough edges and work in and through us. So the first 
area, the first area of uh, characteristics of Moses, which mark him as a type of Christ, uh, is uh, that Moses was very meek, according to Numbers 12, 3. And we see also, uh, let's go over to uh, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 in the New Testament. So we'll compare Scripture with Scripture. Matthew chapter 11 and uh, verse 29. Matthew 11 and 29, where it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I, Jesus Christ, am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Not only is Jesus Christ our example and role model in this, uh, which, of course, Moses is a type of Christ, but likewise, we understand that until we get out of the way, we can't be what God would have us to be. He will not ever be able to do through us what needs to be done until we yield. And so it is our submissive spirit, our meekness that allows him to do that. Now, the second area, uh, characteristic of Moses, which marks him as a type of Jesus Christ, is found over in Hebrews. So let's move back to Hebrews again in chapter number three. Hebrews chapter number three. And uh, we're going to find a reference here. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 2, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So faithfulness is so important. We've mentioned this already. It's important for us in character to be meek and faithful. That combination is a rare combination, but you and I should strive for that by yielding to God. All right, so we come to God, we present our bodies a living sacrifice. We allow him to have his will and his way in our service, in our life every day. All right. And uh, then we also see that uh, Moses was obedient and mighty in word and deed. Turn over to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and verse 22. Acts 7, verse 22. We've read this. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And so these, of course, are the other characteristics. Mighty in words and in deeds. Now, Assignment number two, then, is to list the four characteristics of Moses, which mark him as a type of Christ. And I think about uh, the great missionary, Carey, who said, uh, uh, expect great things from God, but he says, attempt great things for God. It's not the size of, of our will and determination that results in the greatness of the work that will be done for God, but allowing the Lord again through meekness on our part, uh, through uh, the humble and faithful and consistent uh, submission, obedience that we have, uh, being mighty in word and deed, standing up, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. There are some other aspects that we need to get into, and this will be assignment Number three, other comparisons of Moses to Jesus. Please notice the following. In his history, Moses was a son in Egypt where he was in danger of being killed. We saw that early on in the book of Exodus, but also we see this of our Savior Jesus Christ uh, as a baby is taken down into Egypt to protect him from uh, Herod who had the babies killed at that time, in order to wipe out the pretender, he thought, to the throne. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, he was providentially cared for God, that is, Moses was, and um, so was Jesus Christ. Uh, you think of the times when, for example, they took up stones and Jesus simply walked out of their midst early on in the gospel according to Luke chapter 
number four. We, we see this again and again with Moses and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Scripture that has been read already and over in Hebrews chapter 11, we want to go there. Hebrews chapter 11, we read the history as it parallels uh, the uh, life of our Savior Jesus Christ here uh, as he came to give himself for us. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Amazing. He was uh, rejected. And Jesus Christ, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. We understand how that is with rejection. Christ was, uh, of course, condemned, uh, and Jesus Christ, uh, through the blood, uh, was able to deliver his people, and Moses, through the blood of the sacrifice of the Passover, led them out of bondage in Egypt. Contrast, of course, is that Moses did not take Israel all the way into the promised land. Joshua did that. Uh, so, uh, notice the fulfillment of John 1.17. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith, we read in Hebrews 12. Uh, and Moses was not able to humanly complete the task of bringing them into the promised land. So there is a shortfall in that respect. Now, I do enjoy good gospel music that tells the truth. And uh, Jeff Gibson, oh, back in the uh, uh, 1980s, wrote a song that now appears in our hymnals. Moses led God's children 40 years. He led them through the cold and through the night. Though they said, let's turn back. We've seen that already. Moses said, keep going. Canaan land is just in sight. The mark of a, of a great leader, and this is where Moses typifies Christ is that he keeps the goal before the people. As a leader for the Lord Jesus Christ and a teacher of the word of God or a preacher in the local church, you that are listening to me today uh, need to ask the Lord to help you to lead God's people according to the word of God, according to his perfect will and, and not in a willful and, and uh fleshly manner, but in a spiritual manner. That leadership that is entrusted to us is a high, holy, and heavenly calling. And to do this right, we don't want to bore people to death who sit under our teaching and preaching. We want to keep them excited. We want that to cast the vision. One great motivator uh, in speaking of how you can keep kids and adults going, uh, using the terminology of a famous ad that used to be on radio and television, let them hear the sizzle. And I would say, use all five senses and, and keep it alive. Keep it real. Keep it applicable. Uh, help to illustrate. Uh, make it vivid. Make it vivid. But keep the goal before them always. And the goal is not merely a certain number of people or souls or professions, that's important. But the goal is to glorify the Lord and to please the Lord and keep that before the people constantly. The second verse of this song, Canaan Land is Just in Sight, says, Though we walk through valleys, though we climb high mountains, we must not give up the fight. We must be like Moses. We must keep on going. Canaan Land is Just in Sight. And then the chorus elucidates there will be sorrow there in that tomorrow there will be no sorrow in that tomorrow we will be there by and by so when we finally get to the end of the way sorrows and sighing will flee away as john rice wrote milk and honey flowing there is where i'm going canaan land is just in sight we haven't yet arrived uh, whether you 
represent the Christian life and the victory that we have in Jesus. It's not complete yet. And heaven, of course, has been promised to us and will be totally and completely realized when we step through the veil of death or we go by way of the rapture. But in the meantime, we have these teachings so that we in turn can cast the vision to others and help them to share in the efforts that we put forth on the journey to fulfill the call of God and do so by the enablements that are given us, the skill set that he gives us, and praise the Lord for that. Now, we're going to stop and talk for just a few moments about these areas in which we can likewise be like Moses and like Jesus and other ways we cast the vision and help folks to understand that it is through Christ. As uh, Paul said to young Timothy, all right, be strong in the grace that is in thee. All right, grace is our resource. And so we're going to stop and talk about that now. And we're back. This is Bible Institute, session 1902. We have just been talking about Moses being a type of Jesus Christ, both in his roles, his offices, and uh, we have seen some applications to our personal service and also to the fact that we have the privilege of allowing the Lord to work through us uh, to proclaim him and show folks that Jesus is the only way. Uh, Then in assignment number two, we saw the four characteristics of Moses, which mark him as a type of Christ. And he, of course, is uh, meek and humble and obedient and mighty in word and deed. And uh, so many other things as well. We came to assignment uh, number three, assignment number three, and looked at uh, the comparisons of Moses to Jesus. And uh, we have seen already how important this is, that uh, he was uh, rejected as Jesus was rejected. We will experience rejection. All that will suffer, uh, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution And uh, he was willing to do that. We saw that from Hebrews 11, 24 uh, through 26. Rejected by his brethren, received the second time. Rejected, he gained, of course, the bride, which we are. And he condemned Egypt and Christ condemned the world. He delivered God's people through the blood as Christ did on the cross. Uh, He led the people, fed the people, carried their burdens, all of these Uh, The only shortfall on Moses' part as he led God's children uh, through the wilderness, uh, the only shortfall was that he did not take take them all the way to the promised land across the River Jordan, but that was left to his successor, Joshua, whom we'll see later on. The, um, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So for Assignment number three lists the other comparisons of Moses to Jesus. You may have to, you may have to stop and run back through this that we've given you a little more slowly so that you can concentrate, study it out, and put down your answers. All right, this is, of course, session 1902. Uh, we are looking forward, talk about looking forward, we're looking forward to the 29th day of June, 2025, when all of these diplomas are going to be and these certificates are going to be conferred and i want to urge you to do all of your assignments faithfully and if you would like to inquire about the bachelor's program please contact brother tyler candy for further instructions if you'd like to move on from there into your advanced work likewise speak with brother tyler candy all right when when we left off last time we were talking about the wanderings through the wilderness and the various types of those hardships, the lack of water, the bitter water, casting the tree into the water, that's putting Calvary into the bitter experiences of our life and God doing a work of grace uh, within us, the attack of the flesh by Amalek and uh, all the the ups and the downs through which we go. Uh, The wilderness is a picture of real life challenges. And I want 
above all things to emphasize that in your ministry as you serve the Lord, keep it real. As you're speaking about types, use the examples so people will understand uh, the reality. It doesn't get any more real than uh, chapter uh, number 18 of Exodus where we spoke about the subject of pragmatism. I want to clarify that pragmatism alone is going to get you into some deep trouble. Pragmatism is the justifying uh, the uh, end by uh, justifying the means by the end. That's saying, well, we got to a good conclusion. And you might be able to navigate the rough waters of relationships and decisions and choices in life, but there are unintended consequences that are uh, necessarily created along the way if we don't wait on God, His perfect will, through the Word of God, by the Spirit, and wait for His timing. If God doesn't give you green light and you don't have peace about it, don't do it. Now, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, appears on the scene with uh, Moses' family, and he sees the heavy load upon him in chapter 18. And so Jethro says to him, you need to appoint captains, uh, designated people, leaders, and uh, there is a structure. And we might be uh, tempted to say that on the surface is a great idea, and it is. Uh, there are going to be problems later on where his very leaders will rebel against him. He's going to face those kind of uprisings as you and I will, whether it's among family, extended family, on the job, in the ministry. And uh, we need to make sure that every day in every way our life and what we do is guided by the Spirit of God and we are spirit-controlled in, in every single aspect. Uh, pragmatism cannot stand alone. It must be spirit-directed through the Word. All of our decisions uh, to get help, to hire or to appoint or to train needs to be based upon the direct guidance of the Lord through the Word by the Spirit, and uh, that's where we left off. When we come to um, any of the studies of the book of Exodus, we have to look at the heart. We have to look at the leadership, the warm and uh, living leadership of the Lord in and through His leaders. Uh, we have to look at it as it's fleshed out, and while we see the weaknesses and we want to beware of the pitfalls that we see. Uh, we understand that everything we do must be according to the Word of God. God was preparing Moses even as the people were crying out in prayer. Think back to the beginning of the book of Exodus, even before he goes down and speaks to Pharaoh. Uh, there are people who are crying out in bondage. And right now around the world, there are people who are crying out for someone to come and tell them uh, the way to heaven, the way to God. And uh, there are people who are praying for us and with us in the local church and among our loved ones. I've always had prayer warriors and I thank God for them. And I believe nothing is accomplished in the work of God except that it starts on the knees first and foremost. It was Abraham Lincoln who, upon being commended for uh, some decision he had made during the conflict between the states back in the 1860s. He said, nothing great is ever done. They asked him uh, how he was able uh, to get through Gettysburg. He said he knew that God was going to bring the answer. And while that was a, a, a push and shove and close fought uh, battle, uh, Abraham Lincoln was on his knees in the White House praying knowing, having assurance from God that uh, they would come through this difficult time in our American history. There are people who are praying for you. We need to constantly be in prayer. We need to constantly ask God to make us and mold us. And that's the, the main uh, point of our prayer. Our prayer should be, Lord, use me. Lord, work in me. Lord, here am I. Send me. Moses dragged his feet at the beginning. Now, to his credit, he got going. To his credit, he had Aaron as his spokesperson. To his credit, they prevailed through the plagues of Egypt and led God's people out on uh, the Passover and down to the Red Sea. And uh, with God 
uh, protecting with the cloud and the pillar. Uh, they were able to cross the Red Sea dry shod. We have the picture of the resurrection. We have the picture of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and God making a way and then drowning the enemy uh, in the waters. And uh, then that great song of deliverance in chapter 15, uh, following their deliverance and then off in the wilderness and the struggles, the real life struggles that they had. Up to this point, uh, the people of God, when they complain and when they murmur, are not destroyed instantly, but they're going to come under a law. They're going to come under a law which is going to uh, cause them to have to toe the line. <clears throat> God is going to absolutely put up with nothing else. We have seen that the, the law was given for a number of reasons. Uh, in type and ceremony, the person and work of Christ is seen uh, in and through the law that's going to be given. Uh, his glory and holiness are revealed. Man's sinfulness is revealed. Israel is marked as God's chosen people, and they're separated from the heathen Gentile nations. Israel is uh, a, given a standard for God they live in that they might inherit the land and enjoy its blessings. And number five, the law is given to prepare Israel for the coming of Christ. We know that it's the schoolmaster, uh, and in Bible times, a trained servant would uh, take upon himself the task of preparing the child for adult living, and Israel is like an infant child brought through the law, and Jesus, of course, is the one uh, that the schoolmaster has prepared them for. They rejected Jesus Christ, but the law is very, very important for us to recognize its place. Uh, assignment number four is going to be uh, five uh, things that the law is likened to. When we speak of the law, keep in mind that everything that God says is the law. For example, in the Garden of Eden, uh, he commanded that Adam should not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Warning in Genesis 2.17, that in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. They did not physically die. They began to die, obviously, but they died spiritually and there was a separation. Death is just that, a separation. The law in the Old Testament in particular represents whatever God said. That is the law. That's the absolute truth. It is to be followed and so many times the expressions of the law is such that no one is able to keep the law perfectly. And we have that given to us and we understand that it shows us our need of a Savior who will fulfill the law, will be the completion of the law. And that's what we're speaking of today as we get started. God the uh, wanted the people prepared. He wanted them to understand that there were going to be some tables upon which he would write. And these were absolutely true. It would take them uh, less time than it took Moses to descend the mount for them to break the, the first of the commandments. And so the people were incapable. The people were uh, in great need. And they are going to see this even through the law itself. All right, so we're looking now at what the law is like. Assignment number four, I'm going to give you five things that it's likened to. All right, let's go to James chapter one. This is number one. James number chapter number one and verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So God is offering blessings 
for the individual who will look at the law and do so constantly, realizing they're not perfect, but realizing what God's high standard is. God is not giving the law to be broken. He is giving the law to teach them that they are his own and they need him. Uh, they, there is a sense of belonging and identification in the law that is given to them. The law was never given in the sense of the Ten Commandments uh, to us in this dispensation, but is from the dispensation which is now being introduced starting in chapter number 19. The law is compared first to a mirror because, number one, it reveals man's sins. That's number one. The law is compared to a mirror because it reveals man's sin. All right? And then notice Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verse 38 and 39. Acts chapter 15, excuse me. Acts chapter 15 and verse number 10. Verse number 10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now this is in the uh, meeting that's held at the church of, uh, of um, the apostles in Jerusalem. And uh, this is Paul and Barnabas. And they're coming back to report and talking about Gentiles getting saved. All right. So keep, keep in mind, uh, when those included in that meeting said, well, they should keep the law, uh, Paul is, is going to point out that it is impossible uh, that uh, they're able to keep the law. Peter, likewise, points this out. It's impossible that they can keep something that, that even the Jews could not keep. So there it is. Uh, it brings into bondage it brings into bondage since the flesh the flesh cannot obey the law we also have galatians 5 1 and romans 8 3 so it's a mirror revealing man's sins it's a yoke it's a yoke that brings bondage it's a yoke that brings bondage since the flesh cannot obey the law number three it prepares uh, us for the coming of Christ, all right? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23. Let's get this right. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a uh, schoolmaster. You can read this all the way down uh, through chapter 4 and verse number 7. So there it is. So first of all, it's a mirror because it reveals man's sins, James 1, 22 through 25. Number two, it is a yoke because it brings bondage since the flesh cannot obey the law by itself, Acts 15, 10, and Galatians 5, 1, and Romans 8, 3. And it is, Number number three, a child trainer because it prepared the way for the coming of Christ who would come and uh, be their Savior, be their Messiah, all right? And then also, uh, number four, let's turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians and chapter number three, 2 Corinthians and chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three, and it says in verse one, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And here it is. 
Such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency, our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the, the Spirit giveth life. So those first six verses of Second Corinthians chapter 3. So here we have uh, the law compared to a mirror, a yoke, a child trainer, and now to letters written on stones in contrast to the law of love that is written on our hearts by the Spirit, all right? So the law is likened to letters written on stones in contrast to the law of love written on our, on our own human hearts by the Spirit. And then number five, this is important. We're going back to Hebrews again, Hebrews and chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at uh, verse number one, Hebrews 10, 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. All right, so it is a shadow in contrast to the reality and the fulfillment that we have in Christ. It is a shadow of, in contrast to the reality and fulfillment that we have in Christ. Go back to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and beginning at verse 14. Colossians 2, 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There it is. So it is a shadow in contrast to the reality and the fulfillment of what we have in Christ. Now, you can easily uh, picture all of these or, or bring into the lectern of the classroom or into the pulpit of the auditorium where you're preaching each of these or a representation of each of these and show people that the law is likened under those things. It has its place. The law is the very word of God, but the law is limited also as we're going to see in just a moment. So this is assignment number four. The law is likened to what? Five things. Now let's move on very quickly. It's important for us to know what the law cannot do. There are five things that the law cannot do. Back in Hebrews chapter 7, we've already touched on this. Much of this is going to be overlapping, but to give it to you in the sense of a lecture, uh, we're going to break it down, all right? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. If Therefore, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? In other words, why do we need Jesus, who's after the order of Melchizedek, rather than after the order of Aaron? All right, so there you go. It's an argument that's being given here, and we understand that it can't make us perfect. If you read down through verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So uh, assignment number five, and the first thing that the law cannot do is the law cannot make anything perfect. Nothing perfect. All right. Number two, now go back to Acts chapter 13. Now go back to Acts chapter 13, and we're going to start there in verse 38. I had mentioned this before, but let's go to it for this proof. All right, Acts chapter 13, and you know, of course, the occasion. We know that Saul and Barnabas, Saul soon to become Paul, are going out as the first 
missionaries, we would call them missionaries. And in Acts 13 and verse 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. All right, so here we have justification. Uh, there is another scripture here, Romans 3, 20 through 28. Romans 3, 20 through 28. So the first, the first thing law cannot do, it cannot make anything perfect. It can't change the crooked and make it straight. Number two, it cannot justify. Now, justification is God declaring us righteous because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That, that would never happen under the law system. All right. Then Galatians chapter two. And some of this may seem to be, as we have said already, overlapping. But uh, please take it to heart. Galatians chapter two. And verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So the law couldn't do it. Only Christ could do it. Only he could give righteousness. And the righteousness he gives is not what we work up. It's, it's not, you know, w what we have any uh, resource in and of ourselves to accomplish. It is all of Christ. It is what he has done in our behalf and what we've been able to appropriate uh, because of his finished work, all right? So nothing is made perfect by the law, only through Christ. Nothing is justified, no sin is justified through the law, but only through Christ. Nothing is made righteous through the law, but only through Christ. And number four, uh, this is entirely on a personal and individual basis, but if you were to lock people in separate rooms and interview them, those who have truly trusted the Lord would all be in total agreement and that's what we find in hebrews chapter 9 hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 9 which was a figure for the time then present in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did service perfect as pertaining to the conscience so here it is the offerings the sacrifices of the law do not give you peace in your heart that peace comes from God because of Christ. Jesus is our peace. And uh, of course, he is our righteousness. He is our justification. He is our perfection. It's all in the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, the fifth thing that the law cannot do is found back in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and let's turn to verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been given by the law. You see how it's all connected. All right. Now, the law can't give you life. Only Jesus, who is the life, can give you life. So the five things, once again, here's assignment number five. Simon number five, take note of it. What five things can the law not do? And with the scriptures, here it is. Number one, it cannot make anyone or anything perfect. Hebrews 7, uh, 11 through 19, uh, likewise, other verses. Number two, the law cannot justify from sin. Acts 13, 38, 39, Romans 3, 20 through 28. Number three, the law cannot give righteousness, only Christ is our righteousness, Galatians 2, 21. Number four, the law cannot give peace to the heart. That's Hebrews 9, 9. And then finally, number five, the law cannot give life. Galatians 3, 21, only Jesus Christ, who is our life. Only Jesus Christ, who is our life. Now, assignment number six also, let's go ahead and, and put this up. Assignment Number six, we're going to review what I gave you before as the five reasons of God uh, that uh, the Ten Commandments, besides illustrating the person and work of Christ, why we have the Ten Commandments, why God gave 
added those Ten Commandments. Number one, all right, assignment number six, this is a review, to reveal His glory and holiness, Deuteronomy 5, 22 through 28. Number two, to reveal man's sinfulness, Romans 7, 7, Romans 7, 13, Romans 1, verse 9, James 1, 22 through 25. Number three reason for giving the law, to mark Israel as His chosen people, to separate them from the heathen Gentile nation, Psalm 147, 19 through 20, Ephesians 2, 11 through 17, and Acts chapter 15. Number four reason for giving the law to give Israel a standard for godly living that they might inherit the land and enjoy its blessings, Deuteronomy 4, 1, Deuteronomy 5, 29, and Judges 2, 19 through 21. Finally, number five reason for giving of the law to prepare Israel for the coming of Christ, Galatians 3.24, because the law is the schoolmaster to bring the infant unto Christ. There it is, all right? So we have um, have those verses, Galatians chapter 3, uh, actually beginning in verse 23, down through chapter 4 of Galatians, verse number 7. All right, so there we have them. There we have them. This is assignment number six, which is actually a review from last time. Are you with me? All right, let's let's move on. We're going to actually get into the scripture today, and uh, I trust that uh, these scriptures will be a blessing and a help to you. All right, uh, we have looked at chapter nineteen. We've looked at chapter nineteen, and uh, we are going to. Uh, from chapter 19, understand the response that the people of God had when the law was given to them. All right, here it is. We're in Exodus chapter 19. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, where they were departed from Rephidim, were come to the desert of Sinai, pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be, here it is, a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, Sounds like Peter, doesn't it? These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Now this is the wrong emphasis, but this is where they are They're saying, we're going to do it all. We're going to keep the law. They break it even before they get it. All right? And so uh, Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people uh, unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt sit bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up un- into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. This is because no man has ever seen God in a physical appearance and lived. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall be surely stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. In other words, there is going to be abstinence for that period of time. All right, so the third day represents so many things in the Bible. And I want you to think about that as well. That's consistent throughout the number three. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. Reminds me of the storms that we've recently had. 
that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Now, we need to fear the Lord with a reverential fear. Absolutely. Uh, and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on, on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. Wow. An audible voice. Here we go. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up and the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through to, unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to the mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Said about, said bounds about the mount and sanctify it. The Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. All of this for a very important reason. All of this given to us to show us that there is a distance between us and God. While we want to be close in the sense of being on the same page and have the very heartbeat of God, by the same token, we don't want to take upon ourselves the position and presume to be there uh, at arm's length from God where uh, we would violate clear scripture because of our sinfulness, because we cannot come into the presence of a perfect and holy God. That's why the Lord sent us the Son, Jesus Christ, and he made a way to God. And when we saw him, as it says in John chapter 1, uh, we beheld his glory, uh, the glory as of one of the, uh, the only begotten of the Father. We, we see God in Christ. You remember in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus saying, have I been so long with you that... Uh, you ask to be shown the Father. You can see the Father uh, manifested in the life characteristics and so forth, the mannerisms of Jesus Christ, the God-man. He dwelt among us. and We beheld his glory. Uh, next year, when we get into the study of the tabernacle, tabernacle and dwelling, the same thought and the same verbiage is used of Jesus Christ who came among us. He tabernacled among us. So in that, we're going to see the types uh, that we see in Christ fulfill uh, from the tabernacle to Christ, along with many other uh, applications as well. Here we see there's a distance, a separation between a sinless and a holy God who's about to give the all or nothing law to a people who are going to break it repeatedly. It's amazingly. So we come down to the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. And assignments 7, 8, 9, and 10 will be to memorize the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20 and to write a paragraph on each. You say a paragraph on each. Yes, and I'm going to ask a final question that's going to go with assignments 7, 8, and 9, all of it together. We understand that the law is more than just two tables of stone upon which God writes. We understand that there's more to it than the ten, the Decalogue. But this is foundational. This is a beginning. Uh, it never was a plan of salvation because no one could ever keep it. It was a plan to show us our need. It was also organizational in that God, by his nature, is a God of order. And for his people to travel, to traverse the wilderness for 40 years and then live under this dispensation uh, for 1,500 years until Jesus Christ comes to fulfill it is going to require a great deal on their part. They're going to have to be committed to it. It's going to have to 
take on so much more. Uh, Mark Twain, when he was alive, known as a humorist, uh, commented uh, that his great ambition was to visit Mount Sinai. Somebody asked him why, and he said he wanted to see the, the Holy Land, and someone said they wanted to go there and see the place where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And uh, Mark Twain thought that it would be better if we just, instead of traveling thousands of miles to see a mountain in a barren wilderness, better if we all just went home and by God's grace sought to obey the Lord. <laughs> and uh, I understand that. The discussion is quite lengthy when we talk about the dispensation of law. You know that we have the dispensation of innocence. And upon the fall, we have the dispensation of conscience. And upon the end of the, the flood, uh, we have the dispensation of human government that's going to be given. And then upon the dispersion of the Tower of Babel, we have the dispensation of promise begun with uh, Abram and his descendants and uh, on until we have this Mount Sinai experience and we see the sinfulness of man and the holiness of God. We understand that this is now a new uh, twist to their relationship. They're going to have details given to them. It's not just God and a people, but God and a people and a law by which uh, they are uh, special and set apart unto himself as his own peculiar treasure. Anyone who reads the word of God realizes that God at different times in different places dealt in different ways with different people. When we speak of dispensational truth or theology, we mean the word of God as it relates to the program of the day in context of which we're speaking. Here we have these Hebrews in the Old Testament and their special relationship, different from that of Gentiles and different than God's relationship through the blood covenant of Jesus Christ with his blood-bought saints. In this particular time, the dispensation, a special dealing of God with Israel was for a special purpose. Now, God never gives this law to be enforced upon the Gentiles. To impose Jewish regulations on Gentiles or even on uh, Jews today is totally unscriptural. It was for the dispensation, the time of the law. Now, the aspects of the law uh, are to be largely carried out or applied because Jesus is the fulfillment of it. So we know we're not supposed to murder. We're not supposed to commit adultery, etc. We understand that because Jesus Christ becomes the fulfillment of all this in our behalf. But this legal mosaic system, the elements of, of the world spoken of in Colossians chapter 2, uh, is legal bondage to the mosaic system. When Christ was born at the right time in the right manner, according to Galatians, born of a woman, born of virgin birth, and came for the right purpose to set us free he was made under the law. He obeyed the law. He fulfilled the law in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And from that legalistic bondage, all those who are placed, beginning here in Exodus 19 and 20, under the law system are going to be freed through Jesus Christ. The very end of this study, this coming year, will show the ways in which the law applies and does not apply in this particular time. But for now, we need to learn that this was a system of baby steps for spiritual babies. And as we come along in our spiritual development, we no longer need this steps of a baby or of a child or of a toddler uh, system known as the Mosaic Law. All right, we are in uh, chapter number 20, and we're going to go ahead as rapidly as we can. This will be the sprint at the end of, of the mid 
distance race today. In chapter number 20, notice every word. And God spake all these words, saying, I am, that's the title of God, I am that I am. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. When Moses comes down from the mount, and they've already begun to worship a golden calf. They will have already replaced I am with these be the gods. These be the gods. Keep in mind, the people that came out of the Ur of the Chaldees were a, an idolatrous people. Abram had to be introduced to the one true God through his names and by the covenant that was given him. By the teachings, the clear teachings in the book of Genesis, we find that the patriarchs were taught about the one true God in contrast to the idolatrous nations and their idolatrous worship all around them. It says in verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Mark that down. That is commandment number one. You're going to write a paragraph on each of these in assignments seven, eight, and nine, along with one more uh, additional question that we'll ask at the end. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm going to share with you a little bit about the subject of idolatry for just a moment. Idolatry means the worship of idols or the paying of divine honors to any created thing. Be careful. There are those who take this commandment beyond what it was intended. It does not mean that it is a sin. Now, you can have a personal preference if you so desire, but it's not a sin for you to have pictures hanging on your wall as long as you don't do ritual obeisance to those pictures and pray to saints. It's not wrong for you to have even a statue of somebody or something uh, or of a creature uh, if you don't bow down and do obeisance and worship and pray to it as if it has some type of supernatural power. Uh, no individual living or dead has any power outside of, uh, of uh, their influence that's left. Uh, for example, those who pray to the so-called saints that have been designated by a religious organization in hopes that they'll reach God somehow those that uh, address their prayers through any other human than Jesus Christ, there's one mediator between God and man, they're, they're violating this because uh, there is only one God, as we read again and again. And as uh, the uh, second generation is given the law the second time in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, O Israel, there is one God, that's it, one God and only one. People have always wanted to have manifestations of the divine. And I'm not saying everybody that's got a picture of Elvis painted on uh, some uh, cloth surface in their house along with some little, uh, some little image of Elvis, that they're worshiping Elvis, but some almost do. And uh, I've been in homes where there are Buddhas and incense is actually lit to them and uh, prayers are prayed and pieces of paper are burned, and so forth. I've heard about uh, great giant Buddhas uh, in temples in the Far East, where those adherents that worship uh, will go, and uh, they will take their prayers and write them on pieces of paper, wad them up in mud, and throw them up against. And if they stick, they think the prayer is going to be answered. This is idolatry, but so is Anyone who reverences any person, thing, place, or idea, or philosophy above the Lord and above the Lord's perfect will. Anything that comes between us and the perfect will of God, you see, is idolatry. And we know, as uh, we read at, in the last verse of the book of First John, First John and chapter number five, I'm going to go there very quickly. First John and chapter number five and verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves 
from idols. Keep yourself from idols. And there we have, that's New Testament. And uh, certainly we have a repetition of, of this concept. Uh, so no other gods, no other ideas, persons, philosophies, directives, any other things, any other arrangements, any other, any other uh, agreements, any other uh, legal documents or, or expressions uh, of, of like uh, uh, agreements should ever come between us and the perfect will of God. The Bible does write concerning our promises and let your yea be yea and your nay nay. The book of Ecclesiastes says it's better not to vow than to vow and break your promise. But there are people who outside the will of God before they were saved or in some other setting have made promises and they believe in keeping their promises. But that promise may run exactly contrary to the word of God in yoking up with something or becoming a part of something or following through with something somebody says promise me worst thing they can ever ask you to do promise you on their deathbed or in a, a moment of weakness and you make a promise so often we end up establishing an idol to an idea thought a promise a relationship uh, something some other god now here's the second commandment the second commandment is found in verse number four of Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So draw a line back to verse four. This is not prohibiting, like I said, taking pictures, pictures on the wall. I understand there are people who have spooky ideas and Amish people that don't want their pictures taken and people that don't want to put photographs or pictures up on the wall or statuettes. So for there are people who have preferences against uh, the nativity scenes that are frequently put up at Christmas time. Some put them up in place of or in addition to Christmas trees. And even Christmas trees get uh, uh, accused often of being uh, idols in the home. But uh, here it says, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. So there, there's two levels, not bowing in some kind of a ritualistic manner, obeisance, and not serving them, not investing ourselves in them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So we should not be worshiping things bowing down or serving things, ideas, or that which is outside of the will of God. And then it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. This is the, the law of the third and fourth generation. Many of the blessings that we have uh, uh, been a part of that we've enjoyed from God because we simply obeyed him. That's where blessings come from. God graciously grants them. He's not obligated, but he does bless us. And sometimes our children, our children's children, our children's children's children are blessed to the third and fourth generation. Keep that in mind. And showing mercy unto thousands. So blessings, praise the Lord. Thou shalt not take the name, here it is, the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I was just reading on this, and um, the use of God's name in vain is not just uh, swearing by God's name, using God's name that way, or even cussing using God's name, or using a, a variation of God, for example, a... Um, a lesser form of God would be uh, gosh or golly. We need to be careful about that. That's a minced oath. And so be careful about the use of, uh, of gosh and darn and, and so forth, which are replacements for, for words that would be cursing or swearing using God's name in vain. But it goes even beyond that. 
even beyond gutter language and, and bad talk and cussing out and swearing and so forth in anger. But also this, here it is. Uh, God's name in vain can be the trivializing of his name by speaking it lightly. God is my witness or saying God knows this and God knows that. Be careful. His name is holy and a study of his names will show you how important and how uh, vital it is that we watch what we say and how we say it. Using God's name in vain is trivializing his name by regarding it as insignificant, trying to advance evil purposes by coaxing God to violate his character and purposes, or even simply using it thoughtlessly without any attempt to realize of whom we are speaking. So we need to remember high and holy is the Lord in his name. What we're doing, we're doing in the name of the Lord, which means by his authority, according to his word, as we're led by his spirit, uh, as we're yielded to God. This is all part of the same process, our giving ourselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord. So that is the third commandment. And uh, you might find a lot that you can write about there in your paragraph. So on these three, each one a paragraph, number four, verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As we're going to see in our further study of the Ten Commandments, uh, this commandment is not given uh, as uh, a commandment in the New Testament. It was a sign even before the giving of the Ten Commandments between God and his own covenant people. And we know how they, they could gather manna uh, on six days of the week, but not on the seventh. They were to rest. It was to show a sign between themselves and their God. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He is our rest. And according to Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, you can find that to be the case. So the Sabbath day, there are those who make a big deal out of saying that this applies directly in its direct context to Sunday. At no time did Saturday ever become Sunday or the Sabbath become Sunday or Sunday become the Sabbath. I think we ought to honor the Lord on his special day, the Lord's day, the day of his resurrection. But it's not a Sabbath day in the same limitations as it is in the giving of the law here. Let's honor it. Let's be in church. Let's be in church every day, if necessary. They were in the first uh, church in the book of Acts. But uh, let's, not, let's not think this is enforced because it's not enforced in the New Testament at all. Uh, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Remember that. Amen. Amen. There's a, a church right now I'm aware of that's preaching a series on the kicking back and taking it easy and taking care of your body. And, and that may include some biblical principles. It may be about the family and about recreation and about physical fitness and good health and eating right foods and taking supplements and so forth. And the care of the mind, the spirit, uh, the emotions, all of these things. I believe those are important areas of concern for the believer because we are bought with a price. But at no time does the fourth commandment come into play as enforced upon us, only upon Old Testament Israel. So six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy Daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we have four commandments in this uh, dissertation. We have the reiteration of the creation in six days. We believe literal days from the language. And from what we read in context, we believe about 6,000 years ago, everything was created with the appearance of age, including uh, the uh, ageless, long, uh, millions of years of appearance of age in the universe. But God created everything as it was and as it is virtually today and uh, with the appearance of age. So light already on its way to us uh, from distant places, uh, rings and trees, adult uh, Adam and Eve, 
not babies. Uh, babies came later. But you understand, these, uh, these scriptures also teach other incidental truths and uh, uh, teaches the nobility of labor. And we believe in that. Everybody ought to work hard. Book of Proverbs. And it teaches creation. Genesis chapters 1 uh, and 2. How important that is. And uh, also teaches about the Hebrew Sabbath. And about Jesus Christ being our Sabbath. There's nothing more that needs to be done. In order to save, keep and satisfy. And then hallowing that truth. And preaching that. That's why we sing blessed assurance Jesus is mine. That's why we teach and preach uh, what we do about the completeness of salvation and eternal security. All right. The first four of these uh, Ten Commandments are Godward, to Godward. And uh, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And we're going to see that as we come to the conclusion of the matter uh, in the end of this study. Uh, likewise, uh, we know that uh, all of the law and prophets hang on these four and the next six. And uh, we understand that, uh, that Jesus Christ, of course, is the fulfillment of the law. When we come to uh, number five, that's in verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And we look at the New Testament in Ephesians chapter six, we understand that this is still very important. God hallows the family. We have many, many truths about the family, but the family was established by God as the capstone of the creative order after creating male and female. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and, and multiply, uh, replenish the earth. No suitable, no suitable uh, helper or uh, helpmeet uh, was found for Adam. So God created Eve from one of Adam's ribs, brought her to Adam as companion, helper, and uh, together they would reproduce and uh, would raise children. They formed the nucleus of the nuclear uh, family and uh, children became a part of the family, starting out with Cain, who killed Abel. And then we have, of course, the family carried on after that uh, with Seth and so on. Uh, the perfection of the faithful uh, husband and wife uh, is carried on uh, as we see down in the seventh commandment, but we're going to get to that when we get to it. To honor thy father and thy mother. To honor thy father and thy mother means to place them in such a level of respect that as long as we are under their authority, we obey explicitly what is said, and uh, they're going to acknowledge and recognize our uh, maturity, our process of growing and uh, are not going to smother us with their fathering and mothering, but uh, develop us and nurture us. So train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart. We need to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. How important is this? This is the way that we ensure the continuance of the truth through the means of the family. The family is very important. It is a picture on earth of what is in heaven as well. And uh, so the Lord gives us all that we need to understand. He is the perfect parent, the perfect father. We follow his example. We're empowered by the Spirit of God, as we see in Ephesians 5 and 6, to be able to be the husband, the wife, the father, the mother, the child, the family member that we ought to be. And the promise that's given with this commandment is unique, that our days may be long upon the land, long upon the earth, as it says elsewhere. This is so important. I believe this, that people's life span can be shortened or extended according to their obedience to the word of God and God's blessing upon them with good health. And not only the actual length of days, but perhaps the breadth and the width and the experience that we have, the quality of life that we have. And uh, Somebody says, what's so great about living 100 years if you spend 50 of it on a sickbed? And that's very true. We need to live every day of our life and we need to live it to the fullest and make sure that Jesus Christ is our priority. Not only is there to be no other God before us, as we saw, and, and we're not to 
put up, set up any other image in the place of God, uh, any other thing, idea, or whatever, but he is more than just our priority, more than just Jesus first. Jesus is the preeminent one, according to the book of Colossians in chapter number one. Being the preeminent one, we understand that that means he is our everything. Everything depends upon him, and we are going to follow him without reservation. Praise the Lord. We're not going to hold back. We're going to give him our all. Now we come to the sixth, the sixth, and that's in verse 13, thou shalt not kill. The word kill here has the distinct meaning in the underlying text of willfully and deliberately taking the life of another human being. Does not mean we don't kill for food. It does not mean that we are uh, disallowed from defending ourselves. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It does not mean that those who take life should be spared according to what we read. When they came out of the ark, the Noahic covenant, if blood is shed by one human being, then that one's blood will be shed in payment for it. We do believe in capital punishment and make sure you go back and study these scriptures out and understand how true that is. Now, there, there are two levels of this that we see later on developed in the laws of God. Level number one would be a crime of passion or of intent, uh, such as we see in the case of Cain. Cain killed Abel. Now, Mark was put upon him, which was uh, a symbol that as far as his having any part in the, the line of redemption, he was finished, he was through, and he was separated, and he was sent out, and he said that his punishment was too terrible, too awful. Many people believe because this mark was put upon him that it was uh, worse than a physical death. Uh, this is before the the law is fully given before the Noahic covenant is given. Uh, and uh, under the law given there in the Noahic covenant, under the law given here in the Mosaic covenant, uh, he would not be allowed to live. His life would be exacted. His blood would be taken because he had shed the blood of another human being. This is God's program. But there are two levels here. There is the the murder of intent uh, and of of uh, of the passion of the moment in which case that's first degree murder that homicide uh, should result in the death of the person the murderer himself there is a second degree though and in some systems of law it might be called another degree another designation but it is manslaughter and that is when there is the unintentional death of another human being. An axe head comes off, strikes somebody, kills them. Somebody's ox gores and kills somebody. And, um, and so you have, you have different areas of manslaughter than, that can occur. And in Bible times now, as we're going to see in the Levitical law and in the law of Moses, there are cases of manslaughter and the provision of the law for the city of refuge was to allow them to flee the vengeance of the next of kin. If they could get into that city, they would be safe, but they couldn't come out. And we see Abner being lured out and killed uh, as a, an example of that. Jesus Christ is our city of refuge, and that is the application there. Thou shalt not kill. There are very strict and specific laws we're going to see uh, a number of laws given about uh, murder or about capital punishment in the teaching ahead. All right, so we have number six. All right, number seven, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And as we think of adultery, we are going to classify this as all sexual sin, uh, that which is outside of the bonds of holy matrimony. So we will break it down eventually uh, into other categories, such as fornication, which uh, is taken from the same word fornication as uh, pornography, pornea and fornication. And uh, there are sins outside of marriage prior to marriage that are 
uh, prohibited by Scripture. And there are sins outside of marriage during marriage in violation of the marriage vows and other heinous crimes, sexual crimes. So adultery is voluntary sexual relations by either a man or a woman in violation of the marriage bond, and this constitutes adultery, a specific form of fornication forbidden by the seventh commandment in the Mosaic law. Adultery is punishable by death and by stoning, as we're going to see in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The seriousness of the sin of adultery and the severity of its punishment spring from the sanctity of the marital relationship established by God with his creation of Eve as a helpmeet or a su- suitable helper for Adam in Genesis chapter 2. Also, the intimacy of this union uh, in the marital relationship explains the seriousness of any form of illicit relations in God's sight because in sexual union, a man and a woman uh, become one flesh. That's why it is a serious sin in its effect in what it does. And so thou shalt not commit adultery, sexual sin, sexual intimacy outside of the marriage bond. All right. And that should be in the will of God. We understand that to be the case also. All right. That's the seventh commandment. Now the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. And this, of course, has expanded meaning as well. And in your study, using your Strong's Concordance, taking notes throughout your Bible, every page of the Bible should have notes upon it as you're taking notes. Thou shalt not steal means don't take something that does not belong to you, to which you do not have title. I know of an individual who saw a perfectly a good piece of equipment sitting alongside a road. Looked this way, looked that way, saw nobody around, and uh, got himself uh, the necessary equipment to move that piece of equipment to his own property. Later on, he received a knock at the door, and the police investigators were there. And somehow or other, what someone had left and what someone else had seen got traced back to this individual. I would say this individual otherwise was a typical New Testament believer and uh, a, a good individual, a good family individual, a good church member, a servant of the Lord. But this individual thought they could pe- pick up a piece of something that was not at that moment in the physical possession of somebody else and just walk off with it. Well, he found out differently that in our country, you cannot just simply walk away with some with somebody's things, no matter what precautions may or may not have been taken to safeguard it. It's not yours. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers is not a part of our law system and is not part of the Mosaic law. Thou shalt not steal. If you don't have a bill of sale or a title to something, you should. And the people ought to be able to give an account and provide proof that something really does belong to them. You might find yourself in a court of law and facing charges if you're not careful, and you may be absolutely innocent or innocent in your own eyes. But thou shalt not steal means don't take something that you have not purchased or has not been given to you to which you do not uh, have the, the clear title. You need to be careful, and I need to be careful about that. Also, the time that we are employed. We need to give eight hours, if that's what we're to give, in full 100% effort. We need to do our very best. Always doing our best is part of keeping the sixth commandment, uh, the ethics and the morality and the spirit of the law here. Thou shalt not steal. Don't steal time. Don't, Don't steal a paper clip or a stamp from your employer or from the place of business where you work. Don't take home things that are not yours. All right? Um, I know that there was in the past a man who at his place, he was a, uh, an engineer and he developed systems. And when they got done, they had, uh, they had scrap materials that were perfectly good in working order. And he, for each one, received permission to take them off site and use them and construct them for his own personal usage. So thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. All right. So be careful. There is a spirit of this that we need to be aware of. All right. So 
we have the the uh, the eighth commandment: Thou shalt not steal. Then number nine: Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness. This command is an essential. Uh, it is a foundational truth for a just and effective judicial system. I know that our country is not perfect. Our judicial system has its flaws within it. We have seen abuses. I understand that to be the case. But ever since some uh, English nobles met with King John uh, uh, at Runnymede in the 13th century, we have had a system of English laws that has been based upon some, uh, some principles that have done us very, very well. And in our American system of jurisprudence, we have seen the best, perhaps the best judicial system on the planet, even with its flaws. Uh, one of those is we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. When asked a question, even in cross uh, examination, we are to tell the truth. A word of advice, if you're called into court to witness and you have uh, no other uh, option but to fulfill that uh, legal responsibility and obligation. Say what you know. Say nothing else. Say nothing more. Do not expand upon it. All right. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not say or speak against or or spread untruth. Slander comes under this and exaggerating, lying. Uh, telling untruths. Uh, this is so important uh, that we maintain a truthful uh, reputation and life and people know that our word is our bond. It used to be you could shake hands on it and it would be your bond. And today I'm glad to hear there are still people like that. They can shake hands. Uh, a number of years ago, some church people shook hands with me, did not have any intention of carrying out what they shook hands with me on. But that's between them and God, and I've given them over to the Lord and forgiven uh, what was said and done. You and I need to live in the light of grace and the fact that probably if we got what we deserved, we'd all be burning in hell right now. So we have the ninth commandment. Now we come to the tenth and final commandment of these ten, the Decalogue, as it's spoken of, the law in its simplest form, Verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Covet, covetousness is such a um, all-encompassing, overwhelming uh, sin and lifestyle. People who are constantly looking at others, what they own, who they are, what they've attained, and desiring with a sense of greed and a sense of jealousy what other people have. We have the specifics here, the things they own, the people that are in their life, uh, their position, their prestige. <laughs> if you and I want for the glory of God to accomplish something, let's certainly not put somebody up there that we'd want to take from them because uh, God has either uh, granted the uh, blessed or allowed it in their case, and we don't want to go against God. So coveting, keep yourself from idols, keep yourself from any of these uh, Ten Commandments, these violations of God's holy ordinances. My, oh my, I'm telling you, that's, uh, that's quite the listing. So assignment 7, 8, 9, and 10 will be to memorize the Ten Commandments, at least in a brief form, from Exodus 20, write a paragraph on each, yes, and uh, then answer this question. What was the effect of the law according to this chapter, Exodus 20, and now verses 18 through 26? And all the people saw the thunderings, the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So they are convinced of the power and perhaps the uh, 
uh, the fearfulness of God's uh, strength and what could happen to them. And they probably realized their own shortfalls at this point, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, to test you, and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. Now, he's not saying you're going to be perfect. What he is saying is that God's giving you the law is because you are his, just like our children belong to us. There it is. And in the uh, the giving of the law, we know to whom we belong and to whom we owe an answer. They removed and stood afar off. They're putting distance between themselves. They are sadly confessing what they're lacking, who they are and what they are not. Let not God speak with us lest we die. And uh, this is, of course, uh, sad because if they do not, if they do not obey God, they're going to have nothing but curses down the road. And the people stood afar off and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. God came to prove them. They are a distance both in geography and in morals and ethics. All right. What does this do for Moses? Moses is a type of Christ here as the mediator. He's the only one that comes between them and God. They're not going to hear from God except through Moses, and they're going to fight against Moses' leadership, and thus they're going to be fighting against God. And we need to be careful that when we read in the Word or we hear preaching that's hard, and we say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to drag my feet. I'm going to do the very least of this that I can possibly do. We are not simply arguing with the preacher or the church or the standards of the church or the standards of the ministry or the difficulty of accomplishing <clears throat> what the people of God are going to do for the glory of God, but we are actually opposing God. You say, how can that be? Because uh, God is perfect and we are not. And, and the church, yes, but the church, the church makes up God's special peculiar treasure. And God is going to work through the church and God is going to work through his people and God is going to speak through his man. And when we teach our youngsters we teach them to disobey mommy and daddy is to disobey God. And that's true. That's very true in a very real sense. And so Moses is the type of the mediator. And what they're going to do in the future is they are going to have to approach God by the means of sacrifice and by none other. They will come to the priests who are going to be established in the priesthood. They're going to bring their animal or bring their dove. They're going to bring their sacrifice, their meal offering. And they're going to actually have to hand it to the mediator, the priest. And the priest is going to have to offer it in their behalf. And when God speaks, God speaks to the leader and then the leader speaks to the people. It's not a close and intimate relationship such as we enjoy uh, in and through Jesus Christ. Praise God that we have that close relationship. All right, moving on. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. So we, we have this being mentioned. Why is that? Well, first of all, God knows everything ahead of time. And he knows that as soon as Moses is gone a while up on the mountain, why, they're going to immediately do that. They're going to go out and build themselves some false gods. So he is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. God did not want his people to live in abject terror of him as though he is some kind of irrational, uncontrolled, capricious being, a violent force ready to be unleashed on innocent people without provocation. That's not the true personality of God. God wants his people to respect the hazards, the, the consequences of sin. So he clearly tells them what is sin. And he says, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Appropriate fear of God in this sense would make them very reverent and obedient and worshipful so that they might not, as a deterrent, they might not sin. There it is. 
So an altar of earth, it says in verse 24, shalt thou make unto me and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offering. So this is how they will come to God and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou shalt, thou hast polluted it. So no hands on, hands off, hands off. And this uh, repeats again and again throughout the specifics of how the sacrifices, the ordinances are going to be carried out. And it's not to reflect their human involvement. They are merely the servants. They are merely the channels through whom this comes, but they are not to have a hand in it as such. And it says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So they're not to, to go up. They're not to be walking up those steps. And nakedness, as we are going to see, is going to be an outward expression of disobedience. And it still is. The weather gets hot. People take off what they should be covering over. And uh, so here we have the provisions for worship. And God can only be approached except through sacrifice. That's it. And he's only going to come where his name is upon it. Later on, there are going to be the so-called high places of of uh, un, un uh, authenticated and uncoordinated worship. And we need to be careful about these. Jesus Christ uh, built and is building his church, and we need to make sure that our worship is authorized. Uh, the character of the altar is specified. Man's work and man's order are prohibited. You can't be creative. Thus, in worship, everything must be according to God. The introduction of a single thing for beauty or convenience is barred, lest man's nakedness be discovered. In other words, it'll be all of man, and the only way we're covered is if we're covered by God's clear directions. Let me put it to you this way. I'm holding right here in my hands God's Word. You and I are covered because of the finished work of Jesus Christ according to the Word of God. The written Word of God reveals what the living Word of God has done. He died, He shed His blood. We're we're covered by the blood. We're covered by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're covered by the uh, inspired and preserved words of God. We're to do it God's way and not some other way, not our own creative way. If so, then it is going to be as though our nakedness is uncovered and we have a real problem. So to answer the question, this last section, what was the effect of the law? according to Exodus 20, 18 through 26. The effect was people realized who they were and what they lacked, and they stepped away, and they said, Moses, you talk to God and then tell us what he says, and you t and take the sacrifices and, and uh, you offer them, and we don't want to get too close because we might, we might be revealed, we might be uncovered. And then Moses is given and gives in turn the special the special instructions, no gods of silver or gold, guys, nothing phony, nothing replacing, and how you build the altar and how you offer the sacrifices and who offers them under what circumstances, that has to be according to the law. The worship of God, because of the very nature of worship and the nature of God, is that it must be worthy of God. Worship comes from the word worth-ship. Worth-ship. It must be a worthy method, a worthy program for a worthy God. And praise the Lord. As we have given you the law and what is represented by it, trust now that you'll take it to heart, realizing that we do not answer to the law, but we answer to Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law. God bless you. Father, we thank you so much. For this today, bless us in all of our assignments as we continue on in Jesus' name. Amen. We never dismiss a service at Central Baptist Church without offering you the opportunity to respond to what God may be saying to you. Of course, 
Most importantly, God is calling folks to come by way of Jesus Christ and be saved the old-fashioned Bible way. If you've never done that, right now, would you bow your head and would you pray from your heart something like this? Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. And right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Won't you let us know? We'd love to rejoice with you and help you in your Christian growth. And those of you who have been viewing today and need to come back to the Lord, remember this, He is waiting for you. Would you just confess your sins? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just pray a simple prayer of confession. Name your sin or sins as they are and ask the Lord Jesus to restore fellowship. And let us know. We'd like to help you in your Christian growth. God bless each of you today. This is Pastor Brad Winnegar.